Welcome to the March edition of Grand Rounds. Um, today, we have me and my colleague, Dr. Holmes, uh, to present on outcome measures and how we can utilize them to enhance patient care. The whole point of all of this is to enhance patient care and not just do something that is annoying and that we have to do for regulatory reasons. And so we don't have any uh, financial uh, relationships to disclose. And today we're going to discuss first how patient reported outcomes can be utilized to improve therapeutic alliance. We're going to discuss what therapeutic alliance is and what uh, patient reported outcome measures are. We're going to look at specific elements of therapeutic alliance, look at the link between, ah, there we go. So,
don't know. I think we're having some issues here. Ah. Whether we like it or not, though, patient reported outcomes are becoming the gold standard in healthcare. You know, these performance based outcome measures are excellent. They really are. But if you look at insurance models, what they're paying for is the performance or the patient reported outcomes. And the interesting thing on this is it really is based upon the patient's perception. And that is one of the reasons they want to use them more often. I'm not necessarily advocating that that's the one and only way. I'm just saying that this is reality. The customer's perception is your reality. You might be the best, per the best therapist in the world and doing the right thing, but you need to make sure that they perceive it that way or you're going to be in trouble. So historically, patient-reported outcomes have been annoying, first of all. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay, good. I didn't think so. Uh, but they're, they've been put out to meet regulatory requirements and retrospectively review performance. Okay, all important things because, yeah, we want to get paid. Okay. We also can utilize them in real time to facilitate communication, promote shared decision making, clarify patient goals and concerns, as I mentioned earlier, and also enhance this thing called therapeutic alliance. All right, so what is a therapeutic alliance? It's the working relationship that's established through collaboration, communication, agreement, mutual trust, and respect between patient and provider. It's a lot of words, but think about what you do every day. This is what you do every day. Communication is essential to the heart of therapeutic alliance. It's when the patient feels that you, as the provider, understand them, truly what is important to them. In the outpatient world, that might not be pain. Yes, they come in this, why are you here? Pain. Okay, what actually got you to, to here? Well... I'm afraid that if uh, it goes on any longer, I'm not going to be able to care for my dog or for my kids or for my grandkids or whatever. Inpatient. I'm really afraid of going home. I'm really afraid that I'm going to have this injury again and again. Something's going to happen to me. Just two different examples. So interesting about Therapeutic Alliance, it's been pretty well researched, especially in the psycho, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, psychotherapy world, and also the medical literature. There's starting to be more in the physical therapy literature, but that we'll, we'll get to. First, patient-centered communication. If the participant, or if the patient participates in the consultation, not just you doing stuff to them, now, granted, this also takes somebody who's conscious, so I, I get that from the, uh, the inpatient world. If they're unconscious, uh, you got to interact with their family. But for this aspect, if the patient participates in the consultation and you actually listen to their emotional issues, yes, I know we don't necessarily want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but you need to listen to them emotionally. That's one of the ways of building stronger therapeutic alliance. And we might say, you know what? That's not for me. I'm just going to work on the physical stuff because that's what I am. Or, you know, I'm just going to work on the occupational stuff or the speech stuff. I don't want to get down that rabbit hole of, of uh, emotional issues. But let me just talk to you about what therapeutic alliance, enhanced therapeutic alliance can do. A study in uh, 2017, a review of the literature, found that enhancing therapeutic alliance results in improved patient adherence. So you want them to actually participate. You want them to actually, for outpatient, you want them to show up. And uh, for inpatient, you want them to actually be present with you and do the stuff you want to do, not begrudgingly. 
Therapeutic alliance has also been correlated with improving patient outcomes. Interesting. So if you talk to them and about their emotional issues, you talk to them about how they're feeling and how they're doing and what they really want, you actually improve their, your outcome. So then it helps with those regulatory aspects too. Therapeutic alliance has also been shown to improve patient adherence here. 46% of patient adherence was because of therapeutic alliance. So if you enhance it, you improve it by 50%. Patient satisfaction almost improved 70% with improved therapeutic alliance. That's a lot. Therapeutic alliance in another study also was shown to improve patient outcome. And in another study, it actually improved self-management techniques. So they actually participated more they adhered to your program. They actually did what you asked them to do, simply by improving therapeutic alliance. In this study, it kind of found a few, uh, few things. Therapeutic alliance directly improved patient satisfaction and, pay and outcome expectations. Their expectations actually became more realistic. Not necessarily better, but it improved the quality, the accuracy of it. And by being more satisfied, they adhered to your plan better. It's interesting. Ah, chronic low back pain. We never see that ever. But if you improve therapeutic alliance, you improve function. You improve their perception of effectiveness. Interesting, because we're talking about perception is reality. We improve their pain, and we also improve or decrease their disability. That sounds pretty good. Okay, now this is a funny graph, but I'll, I'll kind of describe it for you here. So this study, they looked at people who uh, developed good therapeutic alliance, versus people that purposely avoided uh, therapeutic alliance with their patients. And they provided electrical stimulation. Let's not get into the efficacy of that necessarily right now. But with active e-stim, they achieved this, but no significant therapeutic alliance. As soon as you add improvement in therapeutic alliance, it jumps. Significantly. Sorry, that's the significance line. Also, if you give them sham electrical stimulation, yeah, they improve a little bit. Placebo effect. You improve therapeutic alliance, it jumps up. Interestingly, though, you give them sham electrical stimulation and improve your uh, therapeutic alliance, it does better than active electrical stimulation. Huh. Again, I'm not getting into electrical stimulation, whether it works or not. All I'm trying to say here is you improve your therapeutic alliance outcomes skyrocket. And it's this study, um, by the way, was in physical therapy. So this is actually physical therapist centric. It actually shows that improving the context in which you, pro you provide your interventions have the potential to dramatically improve results, regardless of what it is. So fine, replace that with something that actually might help the patient. You might even do better. This study in physical therapy in 2010 found that therapeutic alliance improved treatment adherence, reduced depressive symptoms. We're not, we're not uh, psychotherapists, right? Correct, we're not but it actually has an effect on the patient. It improved treatment satisfaction and it also improved functional outcome, which is what we're looking for. So ultimately, therapeutic alliance has been shown in the literature to improve patient adherence, satisfaction, self-management, and most importantly, patient outcome. 
All right, so we started talking about patient reported outcomes. We started talking about therapeutic alliance. But how do you, using patient reported outcomes in real time, Dr. Holmes is going to talk more about some of the barriers and uh, some of the real aspects of it. But in studies where they have actually forced providers to talk to their patients about patient reported outcomes, the issues were discussed more clearly. Yeah, more frequently, but ultimately more clearly, and it facilitated communication. In this study, they had some people who were forced to talk about it. Some, uh, one group that was performed the outcome measures but didn't, wasn't forced to talk about it, and then a group that didn't do anything. In the intervention group, above and beyond the other two groups, they found that the patients actually had better quality of life. They had better pain control, and they improved function. I should have said pain control. It didn't increase their pain. It increased their pain control. And again, the issues that the patient had, they felt they were sat more satisfied with them because they were discussed more frequently and clearly. Quality of life is an interesting thing, though. Because who would have thought that just by talking about their outcomes, despite what they are, just the fact that you're having a conversation about them would improve that. Quality of life is how, how you feel about your life, how, how you're doing things. That's something we all strive to improve in our patients, despite our profession. Again, though, Patient reported outcomes measures, discussing them in real time, helps improve communication, which in turn helps your patient understand that you understand them, helps them feel that you understand them, which in turn improves therapeutic alliance, which in turn improves outcomes. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Holmes. He's going to talk a little bit more about how to do this in real life and also some of the real life barriers. Thank you, Steve. All right, so for those of you who know me from the outpatient world, I think um, since the topic we're talking about is outcome measures, specifically patient-reported outcome measures, I think there's a bylaw somewhere that says that I have to talk about photo at least for a little bit. So um, I'm going to discuss the things particular to photo because that's the example, at least in the outpatient world, that we are particularly familiar with. Uh, but keep in mind that it's just it, this whole discussion is not just about photo. It's just one example of a patient-reported outcome. All patient-reported outcomes have some of the same inherent um, challenges and, and opportunities. So for any of you from not from the outpatient world, when I'm saying photo, I'm not talking about your picture. It's just an acronym for focus on therapeutic outcomes. It's a physical therapy, um, national, actually international database for tracking outcomes and reporting outcomes and patient satisfaction that we've been using uh, within St. Luke's for a number of years. So for those of you that are familiar with, with photo particularly, but just keep in mind any patient reported outcome, as Steve kind of highlighted, um, you know, we're, we tend to think about how patients functioning, how well can they squat, how well can they lift their arm, how, how much weight can they lift, you know, we're, we're worried about their functioning. Patient reported outcomes typically are measuring the patient's perception of how things are going, not necessarily how they're actually functioning. And sometimes they align with each other and sometimes they don't, but it's really important that we grasp that, that as we use more patient reported outcomes that we are able to kind of grasp the idea that we're measuring the patient's perception of things, and, and that doesn't always match what we may perceive their their function to be. So with any patient reported outcome measure, the, the message, the scripting that we provide to them before they fill out the outcome measure is extremely important. I can't overemphasize that enough. The, the scripting, the standard, standardization of how we present um, the survey to them, what information we provide, will have a big impact on it, on the mindset that they're answering those questions in and then the inherent outcomes that we get from them and the consistency of that. So uh, it's extremely important to make sure uh, if we're talking about photo that um, we're telling the patient what it is. They, they don't really understand if they haven't had it before. They don't really understand what it is. We have to tell them, you know, it's going to be asking some questions, you know, assessing their perception of their ability to function and that you know, the approximate length. It's going to be, you know, six to eight functional questions. Typically, it's going to take them a few minutes. We also need to make sure that they know they're going to be filling it out today at the time of their evaluation, but we're also going to be tracking it periodically throughout care and at the time of discharge. And it's going to help us do a couple of things. It's going to help us track and measure their outcomes, but it's also going to help the therapist 
to kind of tie back into the, you know, using them in real time and not just rush retrospectively, we can use that information to gain more information to educate them and, and learn more about what their prognosis is and help them in collabor collaborative goal setting. Um, it's also important that they receive the message that when's asking questions about their past medical history, any comorbidities they have, that they enter that information accurately. They're really paying attention and double checking that because that information being accurate is what, what's going to allow us to get the most accurate um, prediction of their uh, expected improvement. I'll be touching on that uh, uh, in a slide or two later. Uh, and then when it comes time for the reassessment, um, when we capture that follow-up survey, that status survey, uh, whether it's a five visits or at the time of their discharge, uh, we're providing that same scripting message. They should be answering those questions based off of the reason they're coming to see us. What's the impairment? What's their injury or disorder that they're coming to see us for? And they should be answering the questions in that mindset and not their kind of overall function. So, you know, if a patient's coming to see you with knee pathology, but they also have a hip issue and it's asking them about their ability to walk, you know, they should be primed to really try to answer that question based off of how much their knee limits them because that's really the outcome we're trying to, to measure uh, is the impairment that we're trying to work on. Um, and that they should answer how they've been feeling most recently. Not necessarily that second or, or last night, but just generally how they've been feeling most recently. And we should also, before we give them that follow-up survey, you know, review with them how we've been doing, what kind of progress we're making, have we achieved any goals? You know, really have that conversation with the patient, kind of see if you're on the same page, kind of review what's been occurring. And especially if it's not the time of their discharge, if it's a status survey, it's a, a follow-up survey, um, kind of partway through care, you know, reminding them that they're a work in progress. Like, you know, if you're two weeks in and you're expecting to have therapy for four to six weeks, that these aren't your final outcomes. We're just grading how you're doing so far, trying to see if we're on the right track. Um, and a, kind of a final piece of this that sometimes I think gets, gets left out that Steve actually uh, had an excellent uh, slide before about having a conversation with the patient. It's great that we can get that outcomes information, but it's also important that we connect the dots back to the patient and have the conversation with the patient. No matter what the, the outcome measures scores are, review it with the patient. You know, if, if they're beating their expected outcome, show them they're doing a great job. And it's not just you saying they're doing a great job. We have this, you know, national outcomes database showing that they're, they're beating their peer group or that they're progressing right as expected. But even those cases where maybe the patient isn't progressing as well as expected, it's still important to review that with the patient, try to figure out maybe where something's missing. Um, or, or just maybe where, where they're not progressing as quickly or they're not perceiving that. Uh, and what maybe you can reconnect with that patient to figure out, hey, am I doing all the right interventions? Have I really captured in my own head exactly what this patient needs to work on? Um, in addition, when you're scripting those uh, follow-up surveys, it's going to ask the satisfaction questions. It's important to make sure the patient knows that they're grading you, their satisfaction with you and your clinic and not prior medical experiences or past experiences. Um, and also just reviewing the results of the survey. Sometimes. Um, Show them that it was important that they filled that out and it, it helped improve their care. Sorry. Sorry. Tech issues. All right. I think we're good.
All right, so that was just kind of one example of the importance of you know scripting and, and reviewing and discussing and in, including the patient in the actual outcome measure, not just having them complete it. Um, kind of backtrack a little bit. If we're going to use patient reported outcome measures in real time instead of just retrospectively, there's a couple kind of conditions that need to be met first. Uh, first off, the patient reported outcomes have to be using validated measures and large databases in order so that they can create accurate personalized benchmarking. So obviously, the outcome measures you're going to be used should have some validity to them. They shouldn't just be made up. But also, they need to have very large databases because if, if you're going to be trying to take this outcome measure that they fill out and personalize it to them, there has to be a, lar a large enough database to create a kind of comparison group that's actually accurate for that patient. Uh, number two, the data presented must be in a format understandable and meaningful to patients. So it's great if you have outcomes data, but it, if the patient can't understand what it means, it, it's not going to be very helpful to the process. Uh, it's not really in there, but but also, in addition to that, it has to be meaningful to the to clinician. The clinician has to look at it and kind of understand what that means and not just be kind of useless or difficult to interpret data. And finally, three, the clinicians have to be able to discuss the patient reported outcome information with the patient in a way that facilitates the collaboration and goal setting and trust with the patient. So that inherent in that is that the, the therapist has to understand what the outcomes are, uh, but more than that, the therapist has to be able to take that connect with a patient and relay that information to the patient in a way and, and help it facilitate a discussion um, about what to expect, what realistic outcomes are. You know, you may be the best therapist in the world and have an 80-year-old patient who's used a walker for 10 years who in his head thinks that he's never had therapy before for his bad knee. So when he's done, he just he's going to be able to run a 5K in 20 minutes. Now, that may not be very realistic, but if that's what the patient's perception is, you could do the greatest therapy in the world. He may not feel like he had a good outcome simply because you didn't have that conversation with him to educate him on what what a realistic prognosis is. And keep in mind that this is stuff that we're all doing anyway. The use of the patient reported outcomes is just another tool, another bridge to be able to have that conversation. Um, you know, you, you may do that without a patient reported outcome, but by using the patient reported outcomes, it, it kind of forces that a little bit. It, it facilitates that conversation and sometimes you can connect some dots that you might not have otherwise without that outcome measure in place. All right, so if those conditions are met, the positives of using those patient reported outcomes in real time, uh, it can improve the therapeutic alliance, which Steve had a couple studies showing obviously. It can increase adher adherence to treatment and improve those patient-centered outcomes. All right, so improving therapeutic alliance. So you know, basically using those communication skills to pr promote collaboration and enhance therapeutic alliance, they can be taught to providers. So a lot of times, especially at least in the outpatient world, I know we tend to think of ourselves as like, you know, very mechanically based. You know, I need to improve my special test skills. I need to get a little bit better my hand placement on this mobilization or this manipulation. But um, improving therapeutic alliance is, it's just another tool in the tool bag. It's just another bridge to helping improve the, that patient outcome. So there are, there are some skills that can be used to improve your ability to connect with patients, just like practicing your manipulations or your hand placements. It's the same idea. It's just putting another tool in your tool bag. Um, they found that training this can help providers engage with patients by listening, asking questions, showing empathy and emotional support. So basically, they're, they're skills that can be enhanced, just like your interviewing skills when you're first learning as a therapist how to perform a, a good medical history. Um, the one that I, I've heard of on improving therapeutic alliance is just kind of like your, your baseline litmus test that I like to use in the outpatient world is take all of your patients and just in a split second, tell me five things about them unrelated to their injury or why they're coming to therapy. You know, okay, I know Mr. Jones has, has chronic tendon issues in his shoulder, um, but what makes him unique? What separates him from the thousand other patients with shoulder injuries that you see? You know, is it that he has a new Labrador puppy that every time he takes him on a walk, he's pulling really hard on the leash and it bothers his shoulder? Or it's getting to be Little League season and he wants to be able to pitch to his son who's going to sign up for Little League for the first time. You know, what are those three, four, five things that, that you can connect with your patient and they're going to buy in then that you're kind of invested in them. You're not just treating your nine o'clock patient with a shoulder injury that you've really learned and connected with that patient and you kind of understand them and what makes them tick more than just you know, yep, that guy's got a shoulder injury. We're, we're going to do some T-bands with him or, or whatever it may be. Um, so I kind of use that as just my own little litmus test that I like is, geez, you know, if, if I'm not feel like I'm connected with a patient or I'm, I'm not sure if I'm on the right track, in addition to just mechanically looking at what's wrong with them, kind of go through my head like, geez, have I, have I connected? What are the five things I can name about this patient? And if I'm struggling, you know, maybe I haven't done as good enough job as I could have with, with connecting with that patient and really understanding um, what makes them them and what makes them unique. All right, so just uh, putting it all together, just wanted to give a, just a couple of generic examples of how you can use outcome measures um, to improve your, your patient care. Just from the surgical world, one example would be, you know, a patient that needs to have microdisectomy surgery. 
Um, maybe post-surgery, their neuromotor exam in their leg is significantly improved. They have a lot less leg pain, but they still have some back pain, and maybe they're feeling like they don't really have a very good outcome. But, you know, as therapists, we say, geez, if you had a disectomy and your, you know, your leg symptoms improved and your leg pain went away and, and you have str more strength and you have some back pain, well, I call that a good outcome. But maybe the patient isn't aware of that. They're not going to perceive the same thing. So, you know, if, if you can have that conversation with the patient, you might be able to set some more realistic expectations and get the patient more bought in that they're progressing well and, and they're where they should be at. From the inpatient world, um, maybe an example kind of like Steve hinted at where, um, you know, maybe patient's doing really well and you think they're ready to be discharged home, but they're having a lot of kind of fear avoidance. They're having a lot of fear about going home. They feel like they're going to fall because maybe they had a neighbor or, or a relative that just recently was discharged. And as soon as they got home, they fell. So they're just really worried and feeling like they can't go home because they're going to fall. You know, it's just a way that if, if you can, you know, capture the outcome and have that discussion with the patient, you can facilitate better understanding with them and, and appreciate where they're coming from and hopefully lead to a better, better outcome. Uh, two examples from the outpatient world, both dealing with the shoulder kind of kind of flip side. Maybe you have a patient that you think is doing really well and they're ready for discharge, but then you saw in their outcome measures, they, they say that they still can't throw a ball. And, you know, maybe throughout the whole course of your treatment, that just wasn't something that, that you connected the dots on that you didn't realize that was something important to them. So they don't feel like they're ready. They're really done yet because they're not back to that functional level. Or conversely, maybe you feel like they still need therapy because, you know, they're really weak. They can't lift things overhead. They, they still have some significant weakness. But maybe to the patient, that's not important to them. They didn't really do a lot of that before they came to therapy. So even though that's a deficit, it's not one that's really super important to them. So just a, a couple examples from across the medical spectrum of, of how we can use that. So really just kind of connecting the dots for everybody. You know, patient reported outcomes can demonstrate value, you know, both through um, the actual outcome measures themselves. Um, and being able to show compared to others what kind of value we're providing that is moving forward how we're going to be reimbursed um, more and more for the care we provide. Um, and therapeutic alliance is guys have, and uh, for those of you online, I really apologize for all the technical obstacles today. Um, such is uh, such is Steve. Yeah, don't forget your certificate before you leave. You want your certificate? Yes. So one of the interesting things about emotional intelligence, we actually did a, a pretty thorough literature search on therapeutic alliance as well as emotional intelligence on the It is a much stronger correlation between therapeutic alliance than emotional intelligence. However, if you really look at emotional intelligence, some of it is understanding your environment. So you could argue that you need emotional intelligence in order to develop therapeutic alliance effectively and efficiently. However, that part hasn't been really correlated with any of the I, I can I can make a logical link to that myself, uh, and I'm betting uh, I'm going to agree. However, I can't say that for an absolute.
question for those of you online was that if somebody is delirious, is there any, uh, does this still hold true? Uh, it's actually correct. Uh, so in, in an inpatient situation. So the interesting thing about a lot of this literature is it comes from psychotherapy more than anything. They've studied this in the and some of these studies were on delirious patients. So, again, there's not a direct link. So there's no therapy, uh, no physical or occupational or speech therapy literature that does show that it can be effective. I would argue you can't use the same patient reported outcomes, but it might just be simply, you know, how are we doing? How are you feeling today? Yeah, okay, they might already have a five minutes from now. However, <laughs> utilizing that patient engagement has been shown with improved outcomes. At least enough to get them that might be the outcome you need, because maybe in that particular patient, the outcome you're looking for is to get them out of the ICU and lead them a step down. Maybe the outcome you're looking for is discharge from the hospital to a skilled nursing facility. Maybe the outcome you're looking for is uh, transfer floors, and, you know, whatever you're looking for, but to, to enhance the outcome of what you're doing, engaging with the patient and communicating with the patient has definitely been shown. Absolutely. That's appropriate, you know, engagement with family or, you know, maybe caregivers may be appropriate. Yeah. As you should. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do have one question from online, so I'll read it out loud. It's for everybody's benefit. Uh, do you find using national photo scores are a good way to help patients come to more appropriate outcome expectations? Uh, yes, I do think that in part that that, that can help, um, you know, you can show that as long as they have their risk adjustment correct, all their COVID-19 diseases are accurate, uh, photo will give you the predicted amount of COVID that they expect for that patient. You know, it's not 100% accurate every time, but it gives a, a ballpark figure, which it can be a starting point to have that discussion with the patient. Um, you got based off of everything else that's evaluated, you can say, hey, look, this is what they're predicting. Like, I think we can maybe see that for uh, X, Y, or Z. Or, you know, I know that they're predicting this. One example I have currently is um, he was in a car accident and has an anchor bracket. So it does have a pretty massive you know, looking factor in terms of the rest, the rest of the heating care. So I didn't have a conversation with them. like, look, I know this is our prediction. I think we get there, but I think this is longer than it gets on the factors to consider. So I, I do think they can at least get started. All right, um, so, and, and to put it into other terms, like say you don't have a photo that has a national outcome. You've seen these patients before. You can correlate, okay, how, how are they doing? And just simply letting them know, how are you, how are they doing in comparison to some of the other patients you have? Yes, you have to be careful with that because if you tell them horribly, you need to A, be able to back that up, and B, they cannot completely get depressed. However, if, um, if you're able to do it in a way that is collaborative and they can understand and actually grasp, it might actually be helpful. Hey, you know, we're doing a whole lot better. What's going on? Maybe that can help start a conversation. Again, this isn't necessarily the patient reported outcomes aren't the end game necessarily. They are from the outcome standpoint. But for the therapeutic alliance aspect and improving outcomes, it's a start. It's a start of a conversation. How do you engage with that and how do you utilize that as an important thing? Yes. Yes. Most of the time it was uh, 
there were a couple different studies or a couple different output tools they utilized. A couple different tools that they utilized. One was the Working Alliance Inventory. That was probably the most commonly utilized one, uh, but there are a whole host of other ones. Um, the ones that they utilized in the studies that I quoted have been validated. There are other studies out there that have used invalidated tools, uh, but questions you guys have. All right. Again, I apologize for any technological issues that you guys have had. Uh, it's been an interesting technology, technology day. Um, please make sure you sign in if you have not, and please make sure you uh, fill out a survey form. And for those of you online, please make sure you email me for your quiz. Thank you guys very much.